the person that got me into NYU and then into the Fillmore was Chris Langhart. Okay. So was it, he was your, was he your instructor at that time? Um, I first met Chris Langhart. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. Okay. And I met Chris Langhart when he was newly graduated from what was then Carnegie Tech Theater School. Okay. And had taken a job with Syracuse University Drama Department as the new technical director. I see. And I was in my junior year of high school at that time. Um, and so the first thing that he was doing was um, doing a summer theater season in the university's theater. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine was working in the box office. So he said one day, hey, you want to go down and see a theater? I'm, I'm working in the box office. We can go backstage and see the theater. So I walk in the backstage door and there was young Chris Langhart uh, trying to oversee a crew of apprentices who mostly didn't know one end of a screwdriver from another <laughs> and teach them how to put electrical plugs on wire and wire up stage lights. And, uh, you know, I knew exactly how to do that. So I said, hey, you want some help with that? And the answer was, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up being the electrician for the summer season. Gotcha. Okay. And, um, and Chris stayed there for a year and I did my senior year of high school, I actually stayed there for two years. And then I went off to college and flunked out because I spent too much time at the radio station. Hmm. And by then Chris had taken a new position as a technical director for the new NYU theater program in New York. So he said, well, you know, you, you didn't make a go of engineering school. Why don't you come down and go to theater school? So I did and spent a year at NYU. That was the year before the Fillmore opened. And uh, by the, the time the Fillmore opened, I had actually dropped out of NYU and was working. That would have been in the fall of 66. And so, and we were all hanging out together in the East Village. Um, in fact, Chris and I were roommates at the time, sharing an apartment. Uh, so um, we looked at this big theater next door, being theater people, and said, you know, hey, they're doing rock and roll shows in there. And um, Chris knew Joshua White because they had gone to theater school together at Carnegie Tech. Okay. And uh, Joshua started doing a light show for shows which were down the street at the Anderson Theater, about three blocks south. Mm -hmm. And um, some, I don't know who actually started this, but somebody in that whole crowd convinced Bill Graham to come to New York and showed him the building that was to, going to become the Fillmore gotcha. and got him interested in turning that into, a, into his New York rock and roll theater. So, of course, when that happened, we all immediately started working there. I was working a full time day job and working nights and weekends on getting that place together, hmm. initially as an electrician. And uh, Bill Hanley did the sound. Right. So, of course, I started working for Hanley doing sound. And pretty soon we figured out that, you know, Hanley had mostly left running it to us. And we looked at it and went, well, there's a few things here we needed to improve. Okay. So by um, 1969, we had convinced Bill that we ought to be able to build our own sound system and replace the Hanley system, which we did. Okay. Well, I mean, let me show you some pictures here at this sure. point. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you should now be seeing a picture. This was when we were designing the, the base speaker cabinets. So, and this was testing them with 1969 test equipment. Um, so there you see a, a fairly good picture of the cabinet and it's before it's painted. So you can really see a bit more of the detail yes. than you can in other photos. Um, here 
is the picture of the balcony cluster yes. sitting at stage level. Uh, this is the new speakers, obviously. Right. But this whole hanging arrangement existed from day one. And it used to have Hanley speakers hanging on it. And that was all Chris Langhart, who said, looked at that balcony and he said, you have to have a center speaker cluster hanging over the stage to do the balcony. And so he took a whole crew up in the ceiling and put in all the rigging necessary to lift that. The, um, so that, well, the speakers, obviously they were in front of the proscenium arch. So, there so there a, a stack of them on either side of the proscenium. Yes. Um, so that meant that that rigging had to go through that ornate plaster ceiling, right? Well, the ones on either at stage level just sat on the stage. Right. But the, but the balcony speakers. The balcony had... one. Yes. You had to drill holes in the ornate plaster ceiling in exactly right. the right place. Okay. I and then just... you had to rig uh, shivs onto the steel beams of the, the roof above that. Right, right, right. So the cables had to go up through the plaster and um, across the ceiling, actually diagonally, because the place where they came through the ceiling was not in the same upstage downstage location as the point where the weight carriage was. Right. I guess weight so. carriage was hidden behind the diagonal plaster on stage left and stage right. So that was, I mean, especially for stage. as young as all of you you were that seems like such quite a challenge i mean that's pretty amazing well that, that was chris langhart who didn't you know i mean he'd been through four years of technical theater school and two years of running a theater in syracuse mm -hmm. so i mean he kind of, and he was always great at mechanicals so uh i guess it was a bit presumptuous but it worked it never fell down so um so this picture you've probably seen. Um, this picture shows you that um, the speakers were flush with the front of the stage, and I believe you put them set back from the edge of the stage. Oh, okay, great. Correct. No, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. As you can see, that Bill Graham is standing in a space that's probably three feet, maybe four feet wide behind the speakers. Right. Uh, this is a close up of the sound booth. This is the original Hanley system that's sitting back. This is the amplifiers that are sitting back here in the rack. Oh, okay. That was, yeah. So that was another question. Was the, the, the amplifiers were kind of in the sound booth with you then? Uh, the Hanley ones were right here. Okay. And if you walked toward that rack and turned left, you went down the stairs toward the stage. Right. All right. Um, the when we rebuilt it, we put the racks out of sight behind this portion of wall right here. Okay. So, but they were always in the sound booth. So, on the other side of the stage, you can kind of get a, a feeling of, and you can see people standing behind the speaker over here as well. Right. And. You can see that, well, let's see. I guess the front of the stage curved. I don't remember exactly, but it certainly looks curved. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I've, I've seen some other photographs where it looks like it was straight. Which well, is... the stage was rebuilt at one point. Right. right. Um, I forget whether that was the summer of 68 or the summer of 69. Um, but it, that's it's in Amelie's book, I know, so I can look right. at it. Yeah, she's got pictures of the stage being ripped apart and rebuilt. Right. Uh, this is all the pictures we have here are the rebuilt stage. Okay. They're not, I don't have, don't have any pictures of the earlier one. Okay. There's another picture. Yeah, see, that that's where it looks that's, pretty much that's straight. straight, actually. Yeah. You can tell it's straight. There's, I think this one's in the book. This is the, this, screen up in the light show platform. I do remember that. This was the electronic shop. Oh my goodness. No, I've not. So that was in the basement then. That was in the basement. Okay. And 
let's see where, uh, just to orient myself is that which which direction is this photo facing or do you uh, would you be kind of facing the, the seating auditorium all behind me you're going toward stage center okay that's what i thought yeah so that's kind of where the orchestra pit was um no it's not the orchestra pit this room actually contained the the blowers for the organ that was originally installed in this theater oh huh. if you walked into the basement right. the basement stairs were all the way on stage left okay right that's right all right so you walk down the stairs to the basement you walked all the way across the basement to stage right and you walk down three more steps and you were in this room. Oh, okay. So this is under the floor of the theater, but it's not the orchestra pit, it's off to the side of the stage. Okay, so it's off to the side of the stage, like towards Sixth Street? Um, yes. Okay. So this was the Fillmore East console. That's a block diagram of it. Okay. And um, this came about because originally, Bill Hanley just had a couple of of uh, mixers that had no EQ on them and just rotary knobs just sat on the table. And um, he had a, a very nice console that he used for recording with nice slide faders in it. And, you know, one and we need, found out that he had a bunch of the extra slide faders. So once again, Chris Langhart looked at that and he said, we got to build a console to replace these terrible mixers we're using. <laughs> and so uh, we convinced Hanley to, to sell us a bunch of his fancy faders that he had left over. Uh -huh. And Chris got the, a uh, electrical junction box, the sort that's, you know, 18 inches wide and, you know, six inches deep. Right. And, uh, sawed a hole in it, mounted the faders in it, and handed it to me and said, here, put some electronics in this and make a console. <laughs> and I did. Nice. <laughs> oh, that's and a... uh, the unique thing about this is that usually when you have a mixer, you have a, the microphone comes in and it goes into a preamp and then it goes into the fader and then they're all mixed together. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing rock and roll, you get so much level coming out of the microphone that when you use the sort of commercially available mixers that we could get at that point, you have to put a big attenuator in front of the, the preamp, otherwise it clips horribly. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at that and we went, well, let's just get rid of the preamp. We have enough level coming out of the microphone that we don't need it. So here's the microphone coming in. There's a step up transformer. Mm -hmm. There's the fader. Then we had three summing amplifiers. And there was no EQ on individual inputs. That was a, you know, we couldn't afford that luxury at that point. And indeed, nobody else had that either. So, mm -hmm. but we had two channels. So any given input could be switched between one channel and the other. And then we had EQ on each channel. And then there was the third, you could turn this on or off, and that fed a separate bus for the monitors to determine whether a particular microphone was in the monitors or not in the monitors. That was it. Wow. But the advantage was that it never clipped. Didn't matter what came out of the microphone, it was never going to clip. You just keep turning the fader down, and it stayed clean. That is amazing. All right. So, and here's a picture of the console in the sound booth. This is the console that yeah. was built by sawing the hole in the electric box. Right. Mm -hmm. And this stuff is just sitting on top of it here. Um, eventually, we added two much fancier equalizers in place of the simple ones that I had built into the console. Um, I don't know what this one was doing. And then we needed more inputs because pretty soon 12 wasn't enough. So this mixer got built and it was basically a, a simpler version of the same thing, except with rotary knobs. That was typically used for mixing drum mics. So you would mix together all the drum mics and they would go into, well, originally into one input on the main console. 
but eventually we had built this mixer over here as well and then this combined together the two channels from the main console signal from the drum mixer and another commercial sure mixer that we had up here so that's the four inputs um i forget what these did was it the guitars that were not not mic or not mics originally well, originally, guitars were not mic. I mean, yeah, you had those big marshals or something. You didn't really need. It would be pointless, I guess. Really. Um, by the time we built the new sound system, we usually ended up putting mics on most people's guitar amps, unless it was one of the people with a giant stack of marshals. Right. I mean, if we were doing, you know, Jimi Hendrix or Blue Cheer or something like that, then there was no point in miking it. It was way too loud to begin with, and there was no <laughs> point making it any louder. So I understand. <laughs> um, I, I but, played, played in a three three guitar band once, and that, yeah, that was it was it was pointless. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, if you if you were doing somebody like you know Neil Young, who had one little Fender in the back line, right? Then yeah, we would mic that. I see. Okay. So um what else do we have here well this was just one of the stage setups it's taj mahal okay with the four tubas what, what type of microphones are those the, um the big... uh, that is an electro voice 668 okay and that's an rca 77 dx that, that one in particular that's not one you normally see for performance is it or, or was um it? It was by the time, well, we collected a lot of microphones. Okay. Because if you didn't have a lot of EQ on the console, then when you wanted something, wanted to change the way something sounded, you just reached for a different microphone. I see. So, and here's the list of microphones that we ended up accumulating. Oh, wow. Oh, well, that's great. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's actually a fairly extensive list. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the Newmans, I always think of that as more of a recording microphone. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an audio expert by any means, but I, I mean, but uh, when I've seen that one. Yeah, well, it wasn't used every day. Um, it certainly wasn't used for louder rock and roll stuff. Okay. But um, uh, it did get trotted out on occasion. And remember, we made a lot of live recordings there as well. So, yeah, right. That's, yeah, I, that thought just occurred to me too. And it is, you know, it. when the recording guys came by with their own collection of exotic microphones and said they wanted to use them, well, I mean, we, they didn't get to use them for vocal mics um, because most of them just wouldn't have worked. Um, except for RCA Records, who showed up one day and, and announced that they had to use their microphone. And so they gaffer taped their microphone onto the side of the Shure microphone we were using. And the, I think it was a Jefferson Airplane show actually. And so the, the singer walks up to the two microphones and sings into the RCA microphone and then sings into the other one and goes, oh, this is the one that comes out of the monitors. I'll sing into this one. And so we went out to the truck so in the middle of the show and they went, all we hear on the vocal mic is guitars. We went, told ya. <laughs> <laughs> Next show you want to use our mic? <laughs> they went, all right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was the only time everybody, anybody ever tried to do that. Um, but if they wanted to double mic the, the drums or the, the amplifiers, then sure, whatever, no problem. We didn't care. We put our mic on it. They put their mic on it. And, um, but it wasn't that common, actually. Mostly we just agreed on what we were going to use. And, you know, if we had somebody with a nice horn section and they had a pair of nice exotic mics that we could use on the horn section, we'd do it. <laughs> I think, you know, I guess like one big comment as somebody who who, who never actually got to experience the, the Fillmore, I always I always wonder a little bit like how much is fact and how much might be a little bit myth. Would you say that it was um, 
great period or or was it more just something that was really advanced for that time how or, is that a fair question or um well it was certainly a time when if you wanted to put that kind of sound in a space that didn't have it or take it on the road uh -huh. that it was a real hassle because there were only a couple of people that could do that at that point hanley was certainly one of them i see okay uh, Hanley was, um, Hanley had accumulated a lot of equipment. Right. Um, and uh, he was not always the best organized and the equipment was not always in the best of repair. I see. Uh, so he knew how to do a good sound job. Okay. When all the equipment worked right, it came out really nice. Um, but, you know, the first time I saw Bill Hanley, it was, and I walked through the lobby of the Fillmore uh, before the opening, and he was sitting in the lobby with a pile of the woofers that go in, went in the giant boxes he was using. Uh -huh. And he was pasting up rips in the cones with pile bond and tissue paper. Gotcha. <laughs> um, which actually worked fine. But if right, you got right. a pair of the, the cones that hadn't had that done to them and they were out on one of your sound jobs, well, and that happened occasionally. So, gotcha. um, um, but, the but thing actually... about the Fillmore was that we got to, I mean, we had a crew that learned how to run all of this stuff. Right. It never moved. And, you know, so we could, spend time fixing all of those little things. And, you know, so when the band came in, um, you know, we knew exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the equipment always worked right. Yeah. And that was a whole lot better than the experience you got on the road at that point. Yeah, I think like when I first kind of started this, I, I, I kind of had this image of, you know, there just had to be something magical about that building or something, but the the more I learned, the more it's it's it was really about the people, and it was and the uh, moment because yeah the moment that was the point where the music was, the music was there, the technology to support it wasn't quite there yet. It was just being developed. Right. Um, I mean, you look, you know, five years after the Fillmore, there were a lot of sound companies. There were plenty of people that could do organized sound on the roads. Um, you know, and the groups wanted, well, the reason to close the Fillmore was all the groups wanted to go play Madison Square Garden. So, so it was the people and it was also the fact that, um, I mean, the, you, you, it, it had an in-house sound system. It had an in-house light show as well. So, so that yeah. was, it was kind of always there and you could kind of perfect that in a lot of ways, I guess. So, yeah. So that, yeah, that, that, that's, that's kind of. One of one of the big takeaways that, that I've learned, you know, through this. So, yeah. Um, but so so I, so I reread that chapter on the Fillmore in um, the book about Bill Hanley, and I think yeah, John Kane was the author, and he starts that with this this uh, quote from somebody saying how the um, the sound at the Fillmore was just so great, so clear, and so loud. Um, so that kind of led well, me to well, think of. I mean, by modern standards, it wasn't that loud, but okay. by the standards of that day, it certainly was. Right, right. So that kind of, I, and, and then I, I looked through his list of equipment and things like that. Um, um, one thing I noticed was the, um, I mean, mo most of those names I really, rec I mean, like JBLs and Altex, and um, th those are names that are still, you know, pretty commonplace. But the... Um, um, I don't... JBL is still with us. Altec is with us in name only. Okay. Well, I mean, I remember. I I I remember it from. I mean, Altec Pro Audio pretty much went away by the 1990s. Okay. Um, but then... they got sold a couple of times, and I couldn't put an exact date on it off the top of my head, but um, certainly by 1990. Altec was really a shadow of its former self. Gotcha. And, you know, the name was being put on imported Chinese electronics at that point. So. All right. But uh, but one name that kind of popped out, I mean, the 
the Macintosh amplifiers, I'm more familiar with them as being like really, really high end uh, stereo amplifiers. I, I didn't realize that they'd made PA equipment also. So no, they were the same amplifiers. Okay. Uh, 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 they just happened to be really solidly built. Right. And they sounded really good. And they were rugged enough that you could take them on the road and they didn't die. Um, but um, in addition to the hi-fi line, uh, Macintosh also made industrial amplifiers. Hmm. Um, so, um, for example, if you go back to the photo that showed, well, the, the, the original Fillmore sound system ran on Mac 275s. That was the Hanley sound system. Okay. And uh, shortly after that, Bill Hanley had a pair of Macintosh 200 watt amplifiers. Those were industrial amplifiers. Um, I believe his were salvaged out of a disc cutting system because they, a lot of the disc cutting systems of the 1960s used that to drive the cutter head. Hmm. So I don't know where he got them, but that was what was in the rack that you saw in the sound booth in my earlier picture it was a pair of those 200 watt amplifiers and a bunch of 275s. Okay. When we rebuilt it, we replaced them with Crown DC 300s. Okay. That was going to be my next question is what what uh what what did you replace the Hanley equipment with? So you repl so you use the, you use the the Crown amplifiers and uh to replace the the Macintosh. Um, yes. Okay. Were the speakers the same brands basically or no, the speakers, the, the woofers in our boxes were JVL. Uh -huh. um, I couldn't tell you the part number off the top of my head, but it was a you know 15 inch JBL woofer. Um, so uh, the horns, we used the Altec horns, I believe the same ones that we bought from Hanley, but we put JBL drivers on the back of them. What, what did that do? What change did that make? Or um the jbl drivers were just a little more powerful than the altec drivers were i think that jbl driver at the time was a 375 hp it was the one with the phenolic diaphragm okay because if you use the ones with the aluminum diaphragm they just didn't survive in that service that's right. okay and that means that that sound system the top frequency limit of that sound system was really about seven kilohertz because that driver got to about seven kilohertz and then it just gave up. It turns out you can make pretty good music with something that only goes up to seven kilohertz. So, uh, and also I read that I guess some of the speakers were used like in storm warning systems. Is that? Um, maybe? I think the, well, the, the horns, particularly the uh, two cell horns, I believe were used in those systems. Okay. Uh, I believe the, Altec had their own version of driver with a phenolic diaphragm, um, which is what Bill was using. And I believe that was developed through those systems. You know, it needed to get louder. And right, right. I mean, and, tried and to get that loud with the most aluminum alarms diaphragm, have... it ended up as snowflakes. Yeah. Um, the levels, the, the aluminum one sounded better, but couldn't take the power. So was the 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 shape of the theater itself and kind of the proportions, was that... Was it an asset or was that more of a hindrance? Or was it, I, obviously, I mean, the, you know, it was it was constructed in the twenties, and you know, it wasn't wasn't designed for loud rock and roll, obviously. So it was more for like, no, but it was actually designed for vaudeville, right? Uh, although it never, I believe, it never operated as a vaudeville house, but that basically was the design. Mm -hmm. um, so it certainly was designed so that. You know, a uh, a performer on stage could be heard by the audience, mm -hmm. and so from that point of view, it was a good acoustical design. Okay. I mean, um, neither Hanley nor us ever did anything to change the acoustics of the the room. Okay. Yeah, kind of just looking at like at the floor plan, and the section. Um, well, especially at the front, you know, where the 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 walls where the um where where the you know the boxes are where the the sound mixing box and the light box they're slightly canted so it's a bit of a megaphone shape 
you know, so it is and the ceiling over the stage is just low enough that it provides a useful reflection and not an echo. Right. Um, particularly for the folks in the balcony where that was really important. Right. And of course, the people that are under the balcony don't get that reflection at all. I mean, the worst part of that room was the part at the back of the main floor. Yeah, that seems like we're too far under the balcony. And the the ceiling, I mean, as far as I can tell, the ceiling was about 11 or 12 feet at the at the top. Yeah, it was quite a low ceiling. Yeah. So it seems like, yeah, acoustically, that would be an issue. Although, I mean, one of the reasons the uh, speaker clusters on stage couldn't be any higher was because they had to be able to shoot under that ceiling to reach the people in the back row on the main floor. Sometimes acoustically, I mean, if you just have wall, you know, a long skinny box with parallel walls, you know, you could get some weird reflections, I guess, going on. But, the, well, what was different about this was like, if you look at that section, the balcony basically puts in a, it creates a wedge kind of in the length of the, of the uh, theater. So to me, I guess in my mind, it seems like that kind of breaks things up that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get too many. Well, it actually yeah. helped to improve the acoustics somewhat. Um, well, when you fill it full of people, you're not going to get much reflection from the audience. Exactly. And yeah. And then the and seats it, were full. It always was full of people. So. Right. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, I think the, the, the most poorly attended show I ever saw at the Fillmore was the um, John Mayall show. It was in July of 69, I think where they recorded the Turning Point album. Hmm. And it was a summer show, which was rare at the Fillmore. Often it was closed for a lot of the summer. Mm -hmm. And that, that was about a, th a 30, 35% audience. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it was so, so few people that I ended up using shotgun mics for the audience mics. So, so, so actually like, like I, I keep working on my visual, you know, computer model of the space so um so one thing that has been missing is you know the actual i call it the rock and roll infrastructure you know i haven't actually shown like I'll, i've shown just boxes but but you know with the information you've given me i can show those in a lot more detail and right I'd be excited exciting to work you know looking forward to doing that so okay that'll be a big help yeah I think of anything else, I'll pass it on, but I can't think of a whole lot else at the moment.